Play. I'm the director of marketing at Flare. With me today is Holden Triplett. Holden has served, been in the FBI, you were in the FBI for 20 years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, just over 15 or just up under 15, yep. Just under 15. And you served in both Moscow and Beijing before becoming director of counterintelligence at the National Security Council. That's correct. So I, I have to ask first, like, when is the Tom Cruise movie coming out? Because that, that sounds like a really, <laughs> really interesting 15 years. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I'd love it. I don't know if I had that. I mean, you know, it, it always it is much more exciting than the Tom Cruise movies where, you know, in reality, the government, a lot of the government work, you're just sitting at a, at a computer and stuff. But um, no, <laughs> they, they were exciting or interesting places. So uh, never a dull moment in, uh, in Moscow and in Beijing. And uh, if I could, if I could start off, I'd love to hear like what what kinds of issues were you working on in Moscow and Beijing? Like what what were the main, what was your day to day like in those areas? Sure, I, maybe I could stop, uh, step back for just a minute. So it, it's, some people may be aware that the FBI does have an overseas presence, um, and uh, it's at the embassies um, all over the world. There's about seventy plus offices or so in the world right now. Um, and the main job of the FBI overseas is to cooperate or try to build cooperative relationships, uh, work on cases together with the local uh, security and intelligence services. Um, and in certain places like the UK or, or say Canada, that's, um, that's usually very easy, right? There's a lot of um, overlapping interests. Um, we usually think about things in the same way, have very similar uh, legal systems and that cooperation. Generally, there's more cooperation that needs to be done than people who can do it. Um, and in Moscow and Beijing, it's, um, it's a little bit harder. Um, you know, it's harder to find those areas where we agree upon. Um, and, and so I, want, I was really attracted to those places because I think um, in many ways that the personalities drive it a lot more. So if they trust you, you can start to build a, a relationship. Um, so we, in Moscow, we worked on everything from um, counterterrorism to the cyber to uh, child exploitation cases, um, which some of you may be familiar with. Those are often child pornography or those um, types of um, really horrible cases, but often they're issues we can cooperate on because generally feel the same way. Um, and in China, it was a lot of, a lot of cyber um, some criminal activity um, and a bit of uh, counterterrorism as well. Excellent. And you now run um, a, are you are now the co-founder of Trenchcoat Advisors, which is a risk advisory firm. Is that correct? That's right. We, we focus on human driven risk. Um, um, my partner, Bill Priestep, he uh, ran the FBI's counterintelligence division for three years, um, worked together for over 15 years on the bureau now outside of it. Um, and really what we're, we're helping um, businesses, uh, universities, and, and some governments um, look at human-driven risk, and that could be everything that functions kind of in the national security space or sophisticated criminals, but it's just this whole new area of, of, of risks that most businesses really haven't had to deal with, and so we help them protect themselves, navigate it, uh, plan ahead, project uh, what might happen to them based on what they do, um, what they have in terms of assets or, um, you know, if they're geopolitically important, that type of thing. Yeah, no, that absolutely makes sense. And uh, so given your experience with the FBI in Russia, China, and then director of counterintelligence, of counterintelligence at the National Security Council, I have to ask, like I'd be doing our, our audience a disservice if I didn't. I bet you have some really, really interesting stories, yeah, either cyber related or not. Um, are there any that specifically come to mind? <laughs> Mostly ones where I'm embarrassing myself um, because, you know, as much as you're there as a partner, um, you know, working, trying to work, build relationships with um, the Russian security and intelligence service, and it was ma mainly the FSB, um, and mainly the MPS in, in um, Beijing, but also the SVR and the MSS and both um, in uh, Russia and, and uh, China. Um, but they they still like to test you um, just to kind of <laughs> let you know that they're watching you and um, they're keeping tabs on you. Um, and so, uh, you know, yeah, so there was kind of a constant uh, people every now and then people would kind of show up walking outside of our home or just kind of follow us around to the zoo. Or the one time I had um, an individual visiting from um, from Russia, and they decided to try to detain him. Um, it was an FBI official detain him while he was there for a while. Um, I'll just give the short version, but it, it sort of entailed me um, kind of sitting down on a tarmac and refusing to to move until they let him through, um, while a plane load of um, other intelligence and security service looked on um, to try to embarrass the FSB into letting him go. Eventually, it worked. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd sort of have to have no shame in those situations. <laughs> People yell, scream, laugh at you, that kind of thing. Um, but it was my only leverage. So that's where I went with. Absolutely. No, that makes sense. And uh, can you, I, I was hoping you could expand a little bit just for our audience's sake on what you did as director of uh, counterintelligence at the National Security Council for those who may be unfamiliar with, unfamiliar with either that, the National Security Council or counterintelligence. Sure. So uh, National Security Council, it's basically a, a convening and organizing body to 
kind of pool all the uh, interest agencies of the U.S. government um, to, to make decisions, right? It's, uh, it's, a, it's really a policy shop. Um, so as a director for counterintelligence, I focus on all the counterintelligence issues um, that were popping up in the United States and help coordinate uh, policy, right policy, and um, you know, sort of to address these issues. Um, mainly focused on China at the time. I was there in 2017, 2018, when we really made a significant change from looking at our relationship with China as one that was more cooperative to one that was at the very least competitive, um, if not conflicting um, in many cases. And we're, we're still kind of walking down that path, I think. Um, but it's it's really focused on looking at um, how the U.S. government writ large and society in the United States um, deals with these particular national security issues um, and, and tries to move things along. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. Um, so thank you for that. I think that's been some great background for our audience. So I'm going to dive into some, some more specific things. When we talked prior to the call, one of the things you had mentioned was that a lot of companies have a really, really hard time taking intelligence, right? It could be some intelligence from tools. It could be geopolitical intelligence. It could be strategic intelligence. And actually turning that into business decisions that reduce or manage risk effectively. Can you expand a little bit on that and see, kind of explain where you see some of the pitfalls and shortfalls that companies are having right now? Yeah, absolutely. And and we've had the, the benefit when I was inside the government and outside to kind of talk with a lot of companies. And so there's some themes throughout it. Some do it better than others. Um, but one of the bigger themes is that you, if you sort of think about um, the sort of process that a, that a company or um, a group goes through in order to um, utilize intelligence, um, you know, you've got this sort of collection piece of it, right? How are you pulling in the information that you need? Um, the analysis part, right? How are you making sense of this? And, you know, because you might have contradictory pieces of information. You're not sure if this is a good source or a bad source or that type of thing. Um, and then the last part is really sort of the, the dissemination, right? Who are you sending it to? But really should be thought of as more of actioning. Um, and we, we've encountered a number of companies who are pretty good at the collection side, bringing in information that they would need. Um, and they may fewer, but some who are really good even at the analysis side, really producing some good products that talk about um, things that are happening um, and you know, for the for the uh, the reader, um, the part where we've seen it, it kind of fall um, down and where this becomes very difficult is is the actioning piece, right? Um, what we see time and again is you know intelligence put into um, you know in some sort of a product uh, you know that says hey this is what's going on and given to an executive or to the board and it you know they may read it and say well this is fascinating um, I know a little bit more about this issue um, but I don't know what to do with it. Right. So what does this mean for me in terms of making uh, taking action? Um, and there's some there's a number of reasons for that, uh, that you can improve that, that make that better. But but by and large, it's, it's because it's not written in a way or it's not understood in a way that um, this is information to help you make this decision. Right. So um, in the government, we talk about something called requirements, which are just basically questions. Right. Things are things the government wants to know. And then the intelligence goes out and gets it and tries to answer these questions. So that piece of it seems to be missing from a lot of businesses where they really defined what are the things we need to know for the next year um, you know, or the, you know, the next two years or five years in order to have a successful business and then collect that information and then start to make decisions based on it, right? And over time, those questions get refined, but it's that sort of process and sort of cyclical process that goes on and on um, that really makes um, gives them a, a decision advantage. And that's what they're looking for. So by yeah. and large, we see a lot of the intelligence come in and it's just sort of great, very interesting, but it's not much more than a news aggregation sort of you know, function. Um, and so it's the action piece they really need to focus on. Right. So taking all of that intelligence, wherever it's collected from, translating that in a way for business stakeholders who may not necessarily understand the technical nitty gritty or the, the direct implications at the ground level and helping them using that intelligence to help them make those kind of decisions. That, that's exactly right. And, and so that's a, that's a big part of it. Um, the other piece I'd say is, is often where, um, you know, just sort of uh, structurally where um, people sit um, within organizations who are dealing with the intel side. Um, most businesses, you know, when they start, talk about intelligence program, they're really just talking about collecting information on risks and threats um, to the business, um, which is great. Obviously, that's a very important part to it, but there's a whole kind of other area that could be, they could collect on as well. Um, but because they're focused on risk and threats, they often put the intelligence people in the security shop, um, which means they report that information up to a CISO or a CSO, and then maybe even goes to a CIO, and then it goes in several layers. If you want it to work well, you really need to have the Intel shop plugged in at the C-suite level, at the top level, getting their requirements, questions that they have to make decisions for the next year, and then feeding that information back to them in a way that they can use it to make decisions. Um, 
doing that, I think really will improve the process. Otherwise it tends to get stopped at a, a lower level and never reaches the people who actually need the information. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. And let's take a specific example on the file list too, right? So um, recently there were US trade actions against China, which prevented the sale of um, semiconductor chips in the vast majority of cases. And so that seems like an area where like kind of on the ground, like very, uh, I don't want to call it low level intelligence, but like very tactical intelligence really needed to be informing kind of like these strategic decision makers on the risks of US taking trade actions against China. And this could be applied to a number of things, right? Like cyber and data sharing cooperation, things like TikTok in the United States, like all of these like relevant issues. Um, where do you see, um, well, from a tactical perspective, where do you see the US relationship with China going here? Obviously, I think we're in, I, I think the phrase was strategic competition now um, or, or something along those lines. And then how can companies adjust their risk or adjust what they're doing on a day-to-day -day for business practices based on that risk? Sure. Um, so I think, and this is obviously a little bit of an oversimplification, but for purposes of time, we can talk about this. I mean, I think there's the relationship can go in a couple of different ways, right? It could improve in the sense of that we'll, you know, start trading more, working together more. It could stay largely the same or it could worsen. Um, and then in the worsening category, I would talk about things sort of slowly worsening or very quickly worsening. Um, the chances of it improving, I think, are pretty much near zero. Um, for a number of structural reasons, um, we just have some very different ways of how we're approaching the world. Um, and those are highly unlikely to be resolved anytime soon. We may have you know, blips here and there where the relationship improves a bit, um, but in, in the near term, and when I mean five to 10 years, 15 years, the chances of an of a improvement, I think, are extremely low. Um, staying the same, um, I think is, that's possible, um, but probably less likely. Um, I think the two likely possibilities are continuing to tack in a direction where there's more and more competition, even outright conflict, not necessarily military, but in terms of you know, disagreements on things. Um, I think that's more likely, um, but I think there is always a possibility depending on less likely to come from the United States, but depending on actions from uh, the CCP and you know, PRC in general, um, we could go into a very negative direction very quickly, right? If there's action vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, it wouldn't even necessarily have to be a full scale invasion. There's a lot of things they could do in between just to sort of disrupt that relationship. Um, other things within China, you know, there's a lot of commentary coming out now that there's, you know, there's some domestic unrest, there's some problems in the economy. Um, so for a lot of reasons, I think that we're really more likely to have it, the relationship tacking kind of in the, in the same direction for a while, where we're sort of essentially in a, in a slow a slow motion decoupling um, for a, certainly in a number of high tech areas, um, but with a chance that that could speed up um, if certain things happen on sort of a, a larger geopolitical um, scale. So I would think people should really be start to thinking about that as that the, the chances, so if they have you know, supply change, which are dependent upon things in Southern China, or they make something that um, you know, they're gonna compete with China on or China needs in order for development, um, then they have a they have crosshairs on their on their back, and they should start taking action to uh, think about how to how to protect themselves. And how do you see um, cyber risk specifically emanating from China? There there seems to always be this like low level back and forth between companies or between countries um, in cyberspace. But do you see you know if as tensions right, if we assume that the scenario is going to happen where tensions continue to ratchet up with China either slowly or quickly, do you see? cyber risk to US, Canadian, even NATO companies increasing dramatically? And if so, how can threat intelligence teams kind of understand that risk and then deal with it? Sure. So the short answer is yes, um, I do. Um, and, you know, certainly cyber, um, because it, it, it's, it's low cost, it's generally they can have some amount of uh, plausible deniability. Um, but I think I would also kind of include that other types of either human recruitment or even physical intrusions, very old school ways of, of doing things on the intelligence side are all possible. Um, and, and the reason is, as you mentioned before, I think um, just taking the example of the semiconductors, right? So think of the, if you've been following this, the U.S. Institute, a bunch of export controls on um, the ability to sell semiconductors into China of a certain type of a certain advanced type, um, as well as selling the equipment to manufacture semiconductors, right? So China used to get all this stuff, all this information, this, all this um, equipment legally. Now they can't. So they're not going to just give up and say, oh, well, I guess we can't get that now. Um, they're going to ramp ramp up, not that they have ever stopped, but they're going to ramp up essentially the illegal methods that they've always been using, right? And so that includes uh, economic espionage, using cyber tools, using people, um, hybrid operations between the two. Um, and so, uh, you, you know, you, you're seeing the signaling from the Biden administration, and everyone should should understand this, that, that 
essentially semiconductors was just the beginning. Um, they see that as a largely a success. Um, and so look in the area of quantum or any type of uh, high performance computing, um, look in the area of hypersonics, um, anything with to do with AI, which or, or data for that matter, which starts to get a larger and larger set of companies. If you think about who has data out there, these are all areas that they're likely to regulate um, in a similar way that they've done with, with semiconductors, which means that if China was able to get access to it before in a legal method, they're going to ramp up the illegal methods now because they still want access to it. They need it and they cannot do it. You know, the, the idea of indigenous development is still a pipe dream for a lot of this tech, the, uh, these technologies. So they need to continue to steal it from the United States, Canada, other NATO countries in order to be successful. So if I were a company at this point, I would be sort of looking at my assets. What do I make? Um, what are they things that other people, China or other sort of geopolitical competitors might want? And do I have defenses in place in order to protect those, right? Focus on the kind of crown jewels of them. Um, stealing is one part of it, but because of, you know, taking just the, the Russia example, um, it's entirely possible if you are a geopolitically important, you know, critical infrastructure type of company, um, they may also target you for essentially for sabotage, right? To undermine you, right? Or if you're competing with a Chinese company, a conglomerate worldwide, they might try to sabotage you um, or manipulate your company in some way or dox your executives to um, do um, reputation uh, harm, that type of thing. So all of these are possible and are likely to ramp up in the, in the coming years. That, that's uh, not the most optimistic take, but uh, I- <laughs> Sorry, no, but not a lot of okay. optimism here, unfortunately. <laughs> It's uh, it's better to probably be prepared than be optimistic. Um, so no, I think that's really helpful. And, and you mentioned Russia there, like, you know, we, we've, so I, I have a, a few questions for you on Russia um, and I, we'll probably get back to China at some point, but with, with Russia, I think one of the things that surprised a lot of analysts is people were expecting if there was a war in Ukraine for, you know, Russia to be able to take out the Ukrainians power grid on day one and even have maybe a lot more cyber attacks against NATO countries and not to say that they haven't happened, but I think people generally expected it to be on a broader scale. Do you see, um, do you think that the Russian cyber capability was overrated or do you think that they've not used some of the capabilities that they potentially have? Um, it, it's probably a little bit of both and some other things. Um, you know, so I think one, a lot was learned in the, in the you know, 2012 and, uh, excuse me, 2014 invasion, um, you know, into the Donbass and, and, and taking of Crimea. Um, and then even before that with the NotPetya attack, um, there was a lot of things learned, especially in Ukraine, about you know sort of backup systems, ways to deal with it. And there have been, as I think people have seen, so there were some attempts to make it um, to uh, conduct cyber attacks. But the reality is, these attacks are extremely time-consuming. Um, they could use, you know, utilize uh, a zero-day exploit that not everyone is aware of, and then they're sort of giving that up. Um, and so I think people need to think about what are they trying to achieve. And the reality is, is that cyber attacks are extremely useful if you're not in a hot conflict. Um, but with the choice, and this is kind of horrible to think about this, but obviously this is a calculation that uh, the Russian military and Russian government are going through. But if the choice is between a very expensive, long-term, take a lot of preparation cyber attack to take out um, you know, the um, Ukrainian uh, electric grid or just shoot some missiles at it, it's a lot cheaper, quicker, and more effective just to shoot some missiles at it, right? And to take it out that way. And that's what you're seeing them do. So I, it's not that they you know, didn't try or didn't utilize or that they don't have the abilities, but I think that in terms of this sort of gray zone warfare, which a lot of times, um, you know, or a regular warfare, um, you know, that the sort of cyber attacks fall into, when you're sort of have this hot conflict um, where you actually are sending missiles, you've got tanks coming in and troops, it's not as, um, it, it's a helpful supplement, but it's not as, as powerful as a tool as it might be. Where I think it could be really problematic is, uh, let's just be clear about my, my view of that Russia, Ukraine is the bridge for them to continue on with um, taking territory. Um, they've having, they're having lots of problems so that those, those dreams or aspirations may be snuffed out, but they have desires to essentially undermine and upset NATO. So I think that's where we're more likely to see those types of um, low level to you know, sort of um, you know, mid-level uh, cyber attacks against NATO countries. Um, and to sort of try to undermine the uh, the relationship. Yeah, no, that that absolutely makes sense. And you know, one of the things that I the U.S. came out and said, uh, I believe it was last month or the month before, was that a cyber attack could be a you know could be a reason to trigger Article Five in NATO. So obviously there was a bit of deterrence going on there. Um, how do you like 
what uh, what level would a cyber attack have to happen that, that you think that they would seriously consider triggering Article Five? And uh, do you see this as kind of a fundamental change in policy? Right, like it was a it was a very declarative statement compared to some less. Uh... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no. I, so th this is a um, this is a huge area of concern. I'll, I'll say um, because there have been um, obviously some attacks in the past where some individuals, some NATO countries, have essentially said they want to um, invoke Article Five, or they've at least considered it. And the U.S. said essentially, uh, "Please don't," because we probably won't respond, not in the way that you're hoping for. Um, so I think this is really the the whole the difficulty with it, right? Is 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 what you know if you had a, a straight up military attack on a country like as, as you're seeing in Ukraine, if that happened on Poland or the Baltics, which are all part of NATO, um, that is a clearly a you know a, a time in which they could invoke Article Five, and everyone else would, it'd be very clear to them that they should um, you know take action. But what if they you know attacked um, you know essentially government services websites that caused you know disruption and chaos, but not any direct, you know, deaths or harm necessarily. Um, what if, you know, that happened in Estonia and Estonia invoked Article 5 and the U.S. said, well, we don't really want to respond to that because we're not going to conduct a huge cyber attack based on that. So I think this is the area where if, if you know, Russia is most likely to try to undermine NATO, right? So it's this area where the escalation is, is not well-defined. What is a cyber attack that is legitimate to, you know, where you could invoke Article 5? And so what they're going to try to do is sort of start low and continue to escalate to a point where they get, they stay just below the line, but they're causing enough problems within a NATO country that it looks like they're undermining NATO, but NATO won't spring into action. That's at least their goal. So the U.S. obviously, as you said, is trying to deter them from doing that by trying to make it, a, a, um, you know, at least draw a line in the sand. Unfortunately, it's, you know, it could, it may, we may, it may be a situation where we would invoke Article 5. It's sort of wishy-washy and that's, you know, that's catnip to, to Putin and, and his cronies. And they're, they're going to say, great, this is an area we're going to exploit and we'll start low and then we'll keep, you know, doing pinpricks until we get close to the line. And then we will back off and do it with another country, but enough to cause problems and make people feel like NATO is not going to come and help them. So it almost strikes me as kind of an expanded game of chicken on both sides, right? So the U.S. and NATO, and I, I'm not casting any aspersions here or saying anybody uh, making uh, moral judgments, but the U.S. and NATO are supplying Ukraine with a lot of heavy weapons, right? And they're trying to do it right up until the line where Russia would consider an act of war. I, I mean, there's been all in the news even recently, the German tanks. And then yeah. on the Russian side, you could see them escalating cyber attacks right below that line where it would be an act of war. So it's, it seems like a very dangerous situation on both sides. 100%. I mean, look, my personal feelings, obviously, I, 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 I want Ukraine to win. And I, I want it. I'm hoping that you know, they're able to hold back Russia. So I, I, and my comments are mainly just, I think it's important for us to get into the head of how Putin is thinking about this and where they're likely to draw those lines. So but the situation I think you outlined is, is, is one that I'm really concerned about, because at the end of the day, I actually think that um, Putin's calculation is they have a lot more to lose if they lose in Ukraine. Um, than the U.S. And at least he believes, he continues to believe that. So in his mind, he can escalate to a point at which he's willing to take the losses, he's willing to take the pain, but the U.S. and NATO are not. Um, obviously, NATO wants to disabuse him of that notion, uh, but they want to be very careful that they don't get it to, right to a point where then Russia feels like they're backed into a corner and they have to use chemical weapons, nuclear weapons, right? So it is a game of chicken trying to figure out, are our lines the same? Perhaps their red line is much sooner than ours, no one really knows, right? So it's, there's a bit of confusion on this. Um, and this murkiness is actually what is the most dangerous time, right? No one really, you have kind of clear nuclear escalatory ladders that we've established over decades vis-a-vis -vis Russia. So people know where those are. This has gotten us into an area where it's a lot grayer. Um, so it's a very dangerous time as we try to figure this stuff out. You know, again, I, I understand the calls for sending more weapons, sending tanks. You know, I think Boris Johnson just at Davos said, they're never going to use nuclear weapons. We should have no fear. You know, Germans send in as many tanks as you want. I, I don't have that type of uh, fidelity or assurance that that's the case. I think it's right to do this very carefully and thoughtfully, steadfast, saying that, look, we're going to be here to the end. Um, but doing it to say that, look, there is a difference between Ukraine security and winning that and that we don't need to have Russia, you know, essentially undermine their security. They can still continue to stay, be secure as a country, even if they don't have Ukraine. We may not convince them of that, but I think that's the right kind of posture that we should be taking. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. And switching to the cyber front, um, you, you you told me a funny story last time we talked about uh, 
you uh, were had become reluctant to out uh, specific Russian cyber criminals to the, the government <laughs> because they were they were getting picked up by the FSB. So I was hoping you could just kind of retell that story for the audience. And I, I think it's there's also an interesting area here where and and a lot. I, a lot of countries use cyber attacks because there's plausible deniability, right? It's really hard to say this cyber attack was done by this nation state in most circumstances. Do you see kind of like this blend of like cyber crime groups that may be state sponsored, but not officially state sponsored, right? Like how, how does the Russian cyber crime ecosystem work in your experience? I mean, it's really, it's, it's a mess. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there, there's been some open source articles about this as well that, you know, individuals who the U S government has pointed out to Russians say, Hey, this is a, you know, prolific cyber criminal who's been attacking us and then you know the Russians are like oh we'll, we'll take care of it and then in, you know a couple months later you know an attack happens using very similar TTPs as the individual told them about so we generally try not to uh, provide them too much information on cyber um, after I was there for a few months just because it wasn't um, <laughs> yeah we didn't want to be helping their program um, so I mean there, there, there's a long story history here with um, sort of Russian intelligence criminal um, groups um, that goes all the way back to 91, which we don't have to get into here. But the, the short answer is, you know, when things fell apart and the KGB sort of got broken up into different parts, mainly FSB and SVR, um, some of the people just left um, and they went into uh, kind of that murky world between uh, legitimate uh, business and illegitimate business. Um, and they continue to do a lot of these um, things. And so there's been a, a really a, a constant crossover between government intelligence services um, in Russia and the criminal world where they've They've recruited from it, pulled people from it, and then even use them for, um, you know, efforts of kind of keeping that plausible deniability. So you have groups that are, you know, operating on their own, but then if the government notices them and says, hey, that's useful, they have access that we would want, then the government might get involved. Um, some of you might be familiar with there was a Tesla case um, where Tesla had almost had an intrusion a couple of years back, which seemed, at least reading the tea leaves on that, it was started off probably as more of a criminal, but then my guess is that FSB or others figured out that they were getting access potentially to Tesla and then they took an interest. Um, and then you have groups that are essentially working for the government um, to do things for the government. Um, those that are politically aligned, you know, kind of for Russia. Um, so it's, it's a really um, kind of murky world. And I think in many ways, the, the Russian government and FSB like it that way. Um, and that gives them kind of a, a step back. As you said, it gets really difficult then to figure out who's part of it um, and, and who's not for attribution purposes. Yeah. So as the, you know, if we go by your assumption that our, your um, prediction that the Russia may continue to escalate cyber attacks against Western and NATO countries like the United States, Canada, Europe, how can companies, what do companies do, need to be doing from an intelligence perspective and then just from a risk management perspective to kind of combat this threat? Because you have China on one hand where our relationship with them is certainly not improving at the moment. And then you have Russia on the other hand, which our relationship with them is definitely not improving at the moment. Um, do you do you see should companies be doing something differently with Russia, like specifically to combat cyber threats from Russia, than they are with China right now? Yeah, I do. I, I think because of uh, that, essentially we're in. And no one wants to say this, but essentially we're in a proxy war with Russia right now. Right? We we are NATO is at least uh, supplying weapons to Ukraine to fight Russians. Um, that you know, there's a whole set of companies that. Um, you know, either are helping Ukraine, Ukrainian defense um, could be help with the rebuilding of Ukraine. Um, all of these companies, Russia has started to um, make noise that they are all essentially potentially viable targets, um, you know, anyone that they want to undermine. But I think companies, as I mentioned before, where they often are focused on, well, I don't have any information or data or IP that Russia would want. Um, the reality is that right now, because of the, um, you know, that we're in this sort of proxy war with them, just sabotaging U.S. companies that are critical, um, you know, undermining them in many ways, um, would have, a, you know, could fit into their geopolitical goals. So I think companies need to understand that certainly if they are, you know, kind of part of the critical infrastructure or important, you know, pieces of it, um, you know, support the U.S. government or military, or even support other companies that are part of, that are, you know, helping in Ukraine, um, that they could have a target on their back. Um, and I think this this is really kind of expanding, and so Russia is looking to. Um, you know, use those companies to influence, um, you know, the U.S. government and hopefully put pressure on them. Um, certainly U.S. companies that are in, um, you know, sort of the oil and gas and energy, that's an area that, um, you know, Russia is very concerned about maintaining dominance in. They want to keep that um, for Europe. They want to squeeze Europe as much as possible. So I think those industries um, would likely be, uh, you know, there's a good chance it would be targeted um, for potentially for sabotage as well, just to hurt, hurt and undermine their operations. 
Um, but I think just the, they need to kind of keep their optic open and understand that they are potential targets, businesses, um, sometimes even much more so than the U.S. government um, because they are softer targets and because they think that they could then pressure the U.S. government to change uh, actions in Ukraine. Yeah, no, that, that absolutely makes sense. And then another topic I wanted to just touch on very briefly is I don't know if you, I'm sure you've at least heard of the chat GPT craze, right? It's like there's this new concept of artificial intelligence. Well, not new. There's a lot of new concerns, especially with the release of things like Dolly 2 chat GPT, where you have very, very realistic fake looking or it's very easy to impersonate somebody with artificial intelligence. Um, and it seems to be getting easier by the day, especially as these a lot of these models become open source. Um, and I, I suspect, is this something that you guys were concerned about from like a counter intel perspective, um, they, these kind of like really advanced impersonations? And do you, do you, how do you see this playing out on the cyber side of things that, in, court, in the corporate world as well? Yeah, I mean, so I, so it's very concerning. I mean, one, just because I, I teach at Georgetown and now I'm worried that the, uh, you know, <laughs> the work the students are going to be turning in, I'm going to need to be ensuring that it's actually theirs. Um, but apart from that, I mean, I think ChatGPT and others, I mean, it's just from my perspective, it's part of a larger sort of proliferation we're seeing of tools and tactics that really used to be in the sole purview of the government, right? They were so advanced, sophisticated that you need a, you need an intelligence service, you need a lot of money, a DOD type of money behind these in order to do it. Um, that's not really the case anymore. I mean, you would just, you know, obviously one of the most, most notorious examples is the NSO group with Pegasus. There's a number of other um, sort of private Intel tools that are out there that allow you surveillance data collection that are increasingly available to all sorts of organizations and individuals. And so you think about these tools that are available and the type of impact they could have on businesses. And I think it's that businesses should be frightened. Um, basically, this is individuals who, you know, you think about in the nation state side who now, you know, Russia and China, obviously, they've had a lot of these tools for a long time. Um, but now you have a lot of other states that would love to steal, you know, uh, sensitive IP or data from the United States, but simply didn't have the ability to do it. A lot of these tools are now available to them, um, which would help facilitate that. And they could buy them on the open market. You've got sophisticated criminal groups who can now use these. And I think, especially in the US, you got to start to think about um, really social and political extremists who want to make a point with a particular business, um, right? They're upset about their ESG policy, for example. You know, it, it, it supports or doesn't support a particular policy that they care about. Um, you're seeing them more and more kind of get pulled into these sort of political debates. Um, and now, if you really want to, hurt them, you have tools available in which you could do that. You could, you know, steal information, dox them, hold them at ransom to say, we're going to show you that, you know, people where your kids live, you know, for certain executives, all sorts of really horrible things that now lots of individuals and groups have access to tools and they could do this. Yeah, as you see, so I, I wanted to, to pivot and briefly mention North Korea and Iran as well to uh, other countries that the United States and a lot of uh, Western countries are not the best terms with. Do you see them as having substantially different cyber capabilities from larger countries like China and Russia? And if so, how different are they? And how does that change the, the risk differential between um, kind of the, the large peer competitors and some of the smaller ones? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I actually would think about it in terms of what they are after from a, a geopolitical perspective, right? So what are the, um, and I think there are differences, obviously, in skill level and, and, and how they conduct their operations. And I think those can be important. Um, but I actually, frankly, I, from my view on where most companies are, I think that that is something they should worry about later. Um, what they really need to think about is, uh, you know, what are the countries based on what they, what this company, you know, what they make, the data they have, that would be after them? And what are the ways in which they might get into that, right? So, um, you know, North Korea in some ways becomes sort of, you know, modern day bank robbers. Um, so if you're in the financial services, um, there's a high chance that they, you know, could be targeting you or looking at you as a way to, to move things through. Certainly in the crypto space as well, um, that has been a, a, a severe issue. You know, it, it's, a, it's pretty amazing for a country that is as, as impoverished as it is, has developed um, some pretty sophisticated, um, you know, uh, cyber capabilities. Um, and they're obviously continuing to, to develop those. Um, and I think you're going to see more and more you know, kind of, I think we have seen in the past some light coordination with China and, and their their services and and with Russia as well. Um, on the Iran side, obviously, that's a lot. A lot of that is driven by sort of the politics of the moment um, and what they're concerned about. Um, and so, you know, there's been less of a focus on sort of, you know, businesses per se and trying to steal information. Um, but part of that's because we've been in this sort of limbo period with JCPOA, the you know the agreement that the U.S. signed with 
Iran to sort of you know, try to deal with the, the nuclear proliferation issue. That is by most accounts dead. Um, and so, you know, we are in a state with, with Iran that it's, it's not exactly clear what way forward we're gonna have. So again, as they are struggling with their development, struggling against sanctions, um, I think they're gonna look to, you know, be able to use those tools in order to create um, sophisticated sanctions evasion networks um, look to be able to good goods to, you know, either set up kind of shell companies to sort of get move things through them. So um, I think businesses should be really, you know, cognizant of the different goals of each of these countries and how they might impact that business. And then they can start to think about, all right, well, they're coming after me. What are their particular TTPs? How do they operate? What are they likely to go after? Who are they going to use? And then start to make defenses um, on top of that. It's a lot of information that I think most companies haven't had to think about, um, but unfortunately, the, the state of things, I think this is an area they're going to have to start mastering and at least have a baseline knowledge in order to really compete. And have those kind of processes in place where they're getting kind of this direct intelligence about what what are the major strategic risks from, from supply chain all the way down to some cyber threats related to countries, to specific countries, and then communicate this at an executive level so decisions can be made there and then passed down instead of people at the bottom communicating things up and things getting kind of lost in translation. Absolutely. That that strategic intelligence, I think, is is, is really important because what we found is there's just a, a general dearth of knowledge and a little bit of, frankly, head in the sand that pe we hear people still talking about. Well, great. When the world kind of returns back to the way it was and, and just it's not going back, if anything, it's going it's continuing to go in this direction. And so as much as I might wish or others might wish that it would it'd go back to a more stable place where it was, you know, we had a lot closer geopolitical and you know, sort of the global connections and globalization was continuing to function in advance. That's just really not where it's going to be, um, and you know, for the next five, ten years, if not more. Yeah, that makes sense. And I want to touch on one last, I think, really important topic to probably a lot of folks in our audience, which is disinformation and misinformation campaigns, and kind of like this uh, this breakdown of truth is <laughs> the easiest way to put it, right? Um, that are often nation state driven and often targeting even specific companies to to create this kind of. Uh, gray zone information space where people aren't really sure what's the truth and what's not. Can you speak a little bit about, about misinformation, disinformation more broadly, how nation states are using it, um, and what companies should be, how companies should be conceiving of it as a risk? Yep, absolutely. Sure. And I mean, this is, in some ways, it's, it's an old tool. I mean, you know, certainly the Russians and the Soviets before them have used disinformation, misinformation in the United States for, for decades. Um, you know, in order to sow discord in the United States. So that part is, is nothing new. Um, what's different now is, is obviously the connections available through information com communications technology allows them to be much more precise um, and allows them to go after all sorts of different entities where before I think it was, um, you know, it took a lot of effort to just to kind of put these general campaigns into practice. Um, but what we've seen is, you know, certainly um, just to take one example, you know, uh, individuals who are making, you know, the companies making COVID-19 vaccine, or were somehow involved in the supply chain, um, either as part of the cold storage for, I believe it was the Johnson Johnson uh, required um, a, kind of a storing at a colder temperature than the other two vaccines did, um, or the other kind of parts of the supply chain that were particularly important. Um, you had, um, you know, essentially Russian um, disinformation campaigns um, going after them, right, to undermine those companies because they wanted to undermine belief in uh, the COVID vaccines themselves, um, that the U.S. had had created one um, that was working, and obviously they saw it as, as politically expedient for them. So I think a lot of companies were, at least the ones that, some that we talked to, were caught, um, you know, they were surprised by it. They didn't really, like, we're just helping make vaccines or we help make cold storage. Why are the Russians coming after us? Um, and, and that's part of this sort of larger um, intersection of business and national security and geopolitics that is happening right now, um, it, it's hard to kind of see that. So I think companies need to think about what they're making and, you know, is there something about their product data, uh, you know, IP that they have that could be used for geopolitical purposes? And if it could, then how can they protect themselves against it? Um, on the China side, we've even seen them, you know, China's trying to create essentially these national champions that will, you know, you know then globalize and, and really grab market share all over the world in all sorts of key industries. Um, so we've seen them in a couple of places actually use uh, essentially disinformation campaigns, one to undermine competitors, um, but then also to prompt themselves up. It was pretty, you know, the example I'm thinking, it was pretty heavy handed, um, but they'll get better at it. Um, they'll figure it out and they'll, and they'll do better. Um, and so I think that um, ability to kind of do reputational harm um, to companies um, is something they need to be really 
cognizant of and watching for it. Um, you know, getting that intel on, hey, what is what's being said on social media about our company? What sort of is trending, if anything, about our particular executives? Um, that type of information, I think, is critical for them under you know getting ahead of, hey, this there may be a campaign starting that they're trying to go after us for some reason. Um, we need to get ahead of it before we get some severe damage, and we're we're having to kind of do cleanup afterwards. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. Well, thank you so much. I think we have uh, we have three questions from the audience so far. If you are interested in having your question answered, please put it in the Q and A section of Zoom. So I'll go ahead and ask a few from the audience now. Holden, I bet you'll be very specific, very, very familiar with this one from your time in counter intel. What about insider threats by China, Russia, and Iran? Um, as opposed to cyber threats to steal secrets. The Swedish case today is a great example of this um, from Don Sorter. Um, so how do you see, do you, do you see the risk as mainly cyber or do you see it as a big insider threat risk as well? Obviously when you get to the nation state side, there's a lot of money, a lot of power that can go into um, co-opting or individuals to do things that they wouldn't otherwise do. Yeah, I mean, I, I am of the belief that, you know, it, the, the two are part and parcel. And so you've got to look at both. Um, you know, if you, obviously there's a number of statistics out there about the type of cyber attacks, but you know, somewhere upward north of 90% still rely on essentially someone clicking, downloading something, um, you know, a loss of credentials or just, you know, a poor control of their credentials. You know, they use the same password for their Amazon account as they use for their, their business account, which a lot of people do, right. Or they change, you know, ampersand for exclamation point, things that a password spray could easily get passed. Um, so my point with that is that it, at the end of the day, you it, you have to really think about it. they may be using these tools, but it's people on one side attacking people on the other side, right? They're trying to get this information out. So I think you know you obviously the cyber tools are are essential, and that's a big piece of it. But if you're not thinking about how those could be combined with an insider, um, then I think you're you're missing a, a significant portion of it, right? You have a lot of um, what we saw continuously, and these are extremely effective operations where you develop someone on the inside to and this is the Tesla case I referred to earlier, they actually had this individual kind of describe the cyber arch defensive architecture. And then they were essentially building a ransomware attack that would have circumvented some of the controls that are there, right? So someone on the inside who can provide that could then make an extremely powerful tool. The problem with this is we actually have no idea how often this happens. Because you think about this, you get someone on the inside who's able to do this um, and they get paid and they conduct someone conducts a cyber attack and it just looks like wow they had some great you know a well designed tool they have no idea that someone on the inside may have helped them figure out how to do this um and it just looks like an extremely sophisticated attack i think it's highly likely that they're using people in, in a lot of these circumstances um or the flip side we see a lot of cyber attacks which are trying to identify individuals in a company that have access to sensitive information information that might be air gapped or offline or that type of thing and then they'll go in and they'll try to recruit these people in real life um, and so I think you really need to think about people as one of the avenues, um, as well as cyber and how they interact together in order to kind of form a really uh, comprehensive defense against it. Yeah, so kind of this concept of a chief security officer sitting at the top almost instead of just a chief information security officer where you're very focused on the how physical and cyber intersect and can augment each other uh, from an attacker's point of view. Absolutely. And I, just my own view on this is I would almost kind of think of a third iteration as you've got physical cyber and employee or human, right? That there are the three different ways you can, I mean, you can literally break into a building, you could use a sophisticated cyber attack, or you could use a person to steal information. But those are the three main tools in which intelligence services are now sophisticated criminal groups can get into your company. Absolutely, thank you so much. The next question we have is, do you think fake impersonations will be utilized more frequently in the future to exploit individuals in order to gain intelligence and resources? And, and if so, what do you think will be the main defense mechanisms for these? And I think this is getting back to our chat GPT and uh, AI video uh, concept from earlier. Yeah, I mean, yes, I do. The shorter, yeah, I, I think they will be. And I, I'm, it's, I think it's pretty frightening to think about um, what they, you know, people already do this, right? They're already trying to impersonate. Um, and, you know, people, some listeners may be familiar with something called the BEC, so that this is email compromise. Um, and these are often people who are impersonating the CFO or CEO or COO of a business and calling and saying, hey, we've got an emergency, quote unquote, you need to transfer $40 million today to this new account that exists here. Can you do it? Right. And I know I'm sure everyone's rolling their eyes, but there's, uh, it, it works surprisingly often, um, even for people who, you know, it's clearly doesn't sound like the boss, doesn't sound like this person. Um, so just imagine when they're able to kind of control voice, content, all these things, they get them more 
um, the number of people who will will fall for that sort of thing. Um, and so I, I think it's going to be a really uh, a really big problem. Um, and so it, again, it just emphasizes um, people need really comprehensive processes in order to, you know, we talked about Intel process before, but processes that they stick to um, in order to, you know, compliance essentially, and then make people stick to it. Um, and I think that's the best way to do it moving forward. Um, the other is they maybe come up with all sorts of, um, you know, I think we're probably not far away from where people are going to more and more use biometric uh, data in order to validate who they are. Um, I know that's a frightening thing for most Americans and probably Canadians too, um, that just, you know, the idea that the, somebody else would have your, you know, uh, you know, fingerprint, iris scan, something of that nature, but I, I don't really see much way or, a way around it. That's at least going to be part of it. And you're starting to see some companies kind of build towards that now. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions, please put in the Q&A on uh, Zoom, or you can just put them directly in the chat, either one. Um, so uh, Holden, I did have uh, one additional question for you, which is how do you see quantum computing impacting things? I, I don't know uh, how familiar you are with it. I, I read recently that there was a researcher in China who claimed to uh, use quantum computing to break encryption, right? There, there's this whole concern over encryption being broken. Do you see that as a, a real threat? And if so, is, is there anything companies can do about it? Yeah, I mean, so again, a lot of it's in theory, um, and and I, I know a bit about this. I mean, the the basic concern is that you know we've had certain types of encryption which we considered unbreakable because with current um, you know computing power, it would take you know a thousand years to break or something or something you know too long that people can't wait for it. Um, the idea with quantum computing is that you know it, it by its nature it would allow you to um, shorten that time to something that is much more practical. Um, and so all of this data, which had been thought to be secure, would now be up in the air. So the first people to achieve you know, quantum computing and be able to actually utilize it could potentially break um, you know, the, the encryption of another country. Um, in theory, they could also create something that was um, you know, uh, very difficult to um, break by you know, any other country. Um, this is particularly worrisome for a country like China um, because they are a they are a prolific collector of data, even encrypted data, um, and they just hold it until a time where they think they can get access to it and then go back and forensically put things together, um, mostly on the counterintelligence side for government, um, but seeing this on the business side too. Um, so I, it, it's a concern that, I mean, that's that's out there. Part of it, though, I do think that it, it's part of this constant count and mouse game, a cow, cat and mouse game, excuse me. Uh, where you know new technology, then there's new defense, and then a new technology back and forth, and so we'll have periods where we have less security than others. Um, you know, if this kind of comes out, um, but I think that this is sort of the way we're going to always have this constant churn of of new ways to undermine security and and you know new ways to to kind of improve security. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. We have uh, a few more here. I'm trying to pick ones that haven't like don't cover too much of something we've gone over now. Um, how do you view AI technologies such as Jack GPT, deepfakes, generating an increasing geopolitical risk? So instead of like instead of speaking speaking of cyber risk at companies, and I think what they're trying to get at here is there was that moment back in the '80s when Reagan uh, said, you know, we've declared war on the Soviet Union. The nuclear weapons are going to arrive in five minutes, and I think it caused a minor freak out on the Soviet side. And I, I think that's what they're really trying to get at. Is do you think think that Chat GPT and these AI technologies could increase risk of geopolitical miscalculations and misunderstandings because of deepfakes and impersonation and things like that? Yes. Um, you know, like I said, we, we have, you know, and some people might fam be familiar with, you know, just going back to the nuclear example, it took decades to sort of develop our protocol that we have with the Soviet Union. We have a, a less well-developed one with, with China, but, you know, includes um, all sorts of ways that the you know, leadership can communicate to, um, and now that you know, some stuff has come out, you know, where that we've almost come to nuclear exchange because of, you know, computer errors, glitches, et cetera. But thankfully, people kind of stepped in and did something. Um, or at least stopped it. Um, I think it's a, a it, it's a real issue, right? I mean, you. I think the way the systems are designed, it, you know, it, it's the sort of funnel effect that only very few kind of get. It stops most of the kind of, um, you know, false positives. I guess you would say that of, of kind of pushing things toward it, um, and only a few kind of trickle out. And then, thankfully, so far humans have been able to stop those. But with this type of technology, you might get so many that you overwhelm the system and it, it it fails, right? And people just at some point think, well, this one's real, we need to, to respond. Um, I, that means we're gonna have to develop all sorts of new protocols um, for um, you know figuring out what's true, what's not, that takes time. Um, 
you know, it's it's really difficult. And there's another example, which some people might be familiar with, you know, this is during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, it wasn't totally clear that Khrushchev had power the entire time or if some of other people in the Politburo were sort of trying to take power. And there was a communication from Khrushchev. Um, you know, the first was essentially this very hard line. Um, and it sounded like they're, you know, the US and the Soviet Union were about to exchange uh, nuclear um, weapons and it was there was no way, no way forward. And then a second teletype came through um, and it was much more conciliatory. And there, for a while, they weren't sure which one to respond to. Both of them were ostensibly from Khrushchev. It turns out the first one was from sort of more um, uh, kind of jingoistic uh, parts of the of the Politburo. So the U.S. just decided to, to respond only to the second one, which thankfully worked. <laughs> but you have some of those and that are just flooding the system again. And who knows? Someone at some point say like, "Hey, it's too risky. I'm sorry. We've got to we've got to take this as, as serious and real, and we've got to respond." So I. I I think that's a real possibility. Awesome. Thank you. And the next question, we have two more and then I think we'll wrap up. How would you recommend managing the line between paranoia regarding ensuring cybersecurity and also ensuring business efficiency um, in industries working with sensitive data? Yeah, and that's a hard one, right? Obviously, because in some ways, you know, just by doing business, you're putting yourself at risk, right? If you have an office, you put yourself at risk because you know you have employees, and so you can get to a level of you know kind of ridiculous paranoia. And say you know tell all your employees they need to work from a bunker and can never go home. Um, that would be much safer, but probably no one would be happy with that. Um, so I, you know I, I think the idea is that you kind of develop um, sort of nuanced ways of of dealing with um, you know each of the issues um, and develop processes. And I think one of the key parts, and I think this is unfortunately. Um, really missed in most businesses is that you make security and risk management a part of everyone's job. Um, and it's sort of almost akin to the sort of days of the, you know, terrorism, you know, the global war on terrorism, where it's you see something, say something, you know, you raise everyone's awareness that this is something that's potentially happening to their company. Here's how you report it and kind of get people working together. Um, and, you know, again, that could at least initially and still some amount of paranoia that everyone's watching it. Um, but what I think needs to happen rather than having a, a security shop, which almost app operates like they're surveilling all the employees and watching everything they're doing. And that just does not inspire a lot of trust in the company. And I think it's really kind of could be a death nail for a lot of a lot of businesses. But bringing your employees into the fold and talking to them, giving them a light amount of training of saying, like, look, this is the world we're in. This is what it looks like for our company. We're going to survive. Um, but we're going to do it together. We're going to do it by protecting things that matter to us, our livelihood, our families, and that type of thing. And you you just create a much more sort of cohesive environment. Um, and I think that's the best way to sort of get that. And then you you have transparency and you don't have people really kind of wondering what's happening or how things are being affected. And that's, the, in my mind, the best way to sort of stop that kind of paranoia. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll add in one from my personal experience is just making sure people aren't afraid to report incidents, right? There's a yeah. lot in that when you have that top down um, monitoring, it can be people can be very concerned that they're putting their jobs at risk if they click on a phishing email, and then they say, Okay, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna uh, wipe my laptop and uh, hope that nothing bad happens, right? And yeah, yeah. So like making a culture where people can say I messed up, there was some, a mistake was made. Um, I, I want to report this so we can get it fixed is a <laughs> is guaranteed to work a lot better than uh, a culture of fear. Absolutely. And, and that's maybe it helps you understand that at some point in their career, everyone will click on one. So you hope to get them as, as few as, as possible, but everyone, you know, moving fast, not thinking, accidentally clicks on something, it happens. So it's better just to, to, to report it than to pretend it didn't happen. And the last question we have for you, Holden, is what have you found to be some of the more creative and effective means of delivering threat information to the C-suite aside from documents that are an in-person briefing? Um, some of the ways that you know we've done in government and then outside of it, um, you know, I think these sort of like, uh, you know, they, they can be a, very time consuming, but do it in a, in a very short sort of kind of an exercise, almost like a tabletop exercise or, um, you know, um, these sort of scenario planning where you talk to them about like, look, here's some, there's been this intel that's come out, here's how it might affect us. Let's give you some extreme bad scenarios extreme you know good scenario and a middle ground just give you some idea and here are some things we can do in order to tighten security or to improve risk management in these areas to sort of deal with that and then let the executive decide all right that's you know what we've bought off that risk we're gonna have to deal with it i don't want to change anything or you know it's worth 
uh, you know, adding an extra step in our daily daily lives because that's a very severe risk that we're worried about. Um, and so I think kind of helping them put it in context of like with a scenario of how it might actually impact the company um, and not making them do that work um, is really helpful. I mean, it, as you might imagine, I mean, when we talk to they, you know, they, they're obviously managing a, a ton of issues at once. Um, and so their ability to think creatively about how a geopolitical event might af affect them, um, you know, that, that's a lot to ask of an executive. So I, I just put it in those, those easy contexts and then and tee up sort of, you know, the decisions of go this way, that way, or this way, and then, and then and kind of move on from it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we, we have one more, and it's a, it's a good question, so I want to I wanna go. Sure. This, this really will be the last one. Do you think that CTI slash information security professional resources are still under what the U.S. needs to effectively achieve current and future objectives? So I, I guess the question is, do you think that the, the current state of what cybersecurity and information security is in the United States is enough? Is Are we doing enough? Is enough being done at a government level and a private sector level? And if so, what, what additional um, resources or what direction should the industry move in? So unfortunately, I think the answer is no and no. Um, and I, I think it's, we've, you know, we have a lot to catch up on. Um, I think from a government level, I, what I would really hope the US government would, and they've started doing this, um, but I think they need to get better at it, is releasing intel about, um, you know, essentially groups, threat groups, and things that are going on. Um, obviously, there's, they've got to balance it with investigations that are going on, you know, intelligence operations where they're collecting more information, um, but I think they need to lean forward on it. Um, you know, I think we've seen with, um, you know, in Ukraine where that kind of um, essentially, you know, intelligence as strategy um, is really, really powerful, right? And getting everyone on the same page to kind of focus on it. And I think that's really key is that starting to understand that we can't depend upon the U.S. intelligence and security services to do everything. Um, this is a part of everyone's daily job now, right? It's a part of your daily life to protect your personal life, to protect your, your information in these cases. And so, Having information about what are the the risks and threats is is really essential. Um, I think the government needs to build a better partnership with the private sector um, because the private sector has a has a huge role in providing intelligence to companies. Um, you know, really are in the golden age of of open source intelligence right now, um, and so collaborating with those tools that are out there um, in a way that um, is able to help companies, I think, is really essential. Um, you know it. As much as we'd like to think that the government um, equities and business equities don't always align fully, um, governments are focused on the threat actors, the bad guys, trying to get them, you know, publicize that information. That often means sometimes information, you know, it's they're taking action after something has happened. For businesses, they want to be preventative. They want they don't want to lose information. It's not just about getting the bad guys. Um, so I think that there's a there's they need different resources, um, but those you know resources need to collaborate together in order to kind of form a, a, a much more um, protective layer. Uh, Public-private partnerships have had a long, really positive history, I think, in, in the United States, um, and it, that's really our our strength, creating much more agile, nimble responses um, that I think are much more protective to companies. Excellent, thank you. Um, well, I'm going to just do a brief pitch on what Flare does. You, you kind of teed me up for it perfectly there with actionable intelligence. So Flare automates exposure monitoring across the dark and the clear web and, and delivers company action, delivers companies actionable intelligence that they can use to reduce risk. So things ranging from human error, like secret leakage on public GitHub repositories, employees accidentally uploading files to pastebin or other sites that they shouldn't be, along with dark web threat actors targeting them, like ransomware groups and people selling infected devices. Um, Holden, do you want to take a minute and just uh, do a, a kind of final pitch for Code Advisors before we hop off? Sure. I'd be conscious of time. I don't want to hold in one. So uh, Trench Code Advisors, again, it's um, uh, we deal with human-driven risk, um, help people understand um, how that's impacting um, their company um, with helping them improve, enhance, build, and even at times run their security and risk operations, um, helping them deal with incidents, um, you know, investigative guidance, um, dealing with um, sort of national security impact to m a transactions to investors all these sorts of things that frankly have used to go just swimmingly and and with no problems in the business world but because of this intersection with national security um, all the export controls the CFIUS reviews that are out there um, it's really putting businesses in a difficult spot where they need guidance on how is the government likely to um, you know, to, to look at this transaction, look at this business, look at this investor. Um, we have deep, uh, fortunately, to have deep experience from the intelligence community about how they're going to see what that what is a what is a critical technology, what is critical infrastructure, what is critical data. 
um, and help companies understand how to navigate that. Well, thank you so much, Holden, the eternal optimist. We really appreciated having you today. It was great. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you for all of our attendees. Have a great day, everybody.